why don't we start by having a quick introduction of who you guys are, a little bit, little bit about your firm, just as quick as possible, and then we'll kind of jump into some conversations. How does that sound? Sure. Hey, everybody. Joe Blair, Obvious Ventures. Uh, we invest in disruptive technologies, going after some of the world's biggest problems. Um, we're uh, interested in the aviation space. We've made an investment in a company called Lilium, um, and uh, we're excited about ex exploring the rest of the ecosystem. Hey, I'm Paul Willard. I work at Storm Ventures. We're an enterprise software investor. Before there was an internet, I worked for Boeing as an aerodynamics engineer, and I've done some aircraft investing both at work and personally. Hi, I'm Ethan Petrosky. I'm a partner at Benrock. I lead our emerging tech practice. Uh, I am a private plane pilot, and I sit on the board of Skyrise, a company focused on autonomy and aviation. Great. Dean Donovan, Diamond Stream Partners. We are a specialized travel and aviation investor and uh, have invested in a variety of different uh, uh, companies in the space. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Raj Singh. I work for JetBlue Technology Ventures, wholly owned subsidiary of JetBlue, the airline. We invest in travel, transportation, and hospitality. Um, you saw JetSuite X and uh, Zunum earlier. Uh, so they're, those are both uh, investments that we and JetBlue have made, and also in um, Joby Aviation. Bilal Zuberi here with a partner at a firm called Lux Capital, managing about a billion and a half dollars invested across satellites, drones, robotics, autonomous cars, etc. To start out of our conversation, one of the big topics at this has been kind of the new business models in, in aerospace, as well as the combination of autonomous flying, electrification, VTOL, all of the above. As we kind of, and I know this group isn't as familiar, you guys are all, almost all from Silicon Valley. Talk about kind of, if one of you could, one or two of you could speak out about how many of you are really focused on technology, innovative, changing technologies versus some of, would, uh, some of you who would also invest in aerospace, evolution, new business models, kind of more incremental uh, progress. I think that kind of defines the, I also put that out because some of you are really traditional, like a Venrock is a really traditional venture capital firm in the Valley, and some of you are more JetBlue, and Dean, you're a little more, you've got Valeris, so kind of bring things. Anyone want to take that? Yeah, I'll take Great. it. Um, so I, I, I would say we're not overly dogmatic or, or in terms of are we you know, technology investors or business model investors. The way we look at things is, you know, what is the biggest bottleneck in the industry? And, and when we looked at this industry about two years ago, we saw that the biggest bottleneck at the time was the aircraft. I mean, people, there's just not an aircraft that can complete the missions that we're talking about. So that's what spurred our investment in Lilium, which is a technology play, but, you know, time will tell, but it could also be a... Urban mobility. Yeah, we're, we're focused on solving some of the biggest problems of our time, and one mm -hmm. of those is, is urban mobility. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah, sure. I, I'll I'll uh, give it a shot. Um, so we're we're less focused purely on technology, although we do make technology investments. What we're interested in is uh, either new business models or business models that will be transformed because of technolo technological innovation. So, for example, we'd be very open to investing in aerospace. Uh, we've done some technology investing, but we also think that there are very interesting. Um, blocking and tackling investments that you can make in this space. So for example, 135 operators that could take advantage of electronic or, or electric technologies that are coming out. I, I think the way to think about it and the way we frame it is on along the technology disruption curve. So if you think about the evolution of your technologies and how they evolve into markets, they start as new technologies or emerging technologies. Uh, they're enabling of a new capability. Um, as the maturity uh, evolves, it becomes a new category. That new category is a new market. It's built on that new technology. As the category matures, it becomes a mature market, and then you start to see players resegmenting that market. And so in each of those phases within the market evolution, uh, there are different investment theses, there are different companies that um, emerge. And so for a Venrock, we focus on the new technologies and new categories. And we try to avoid the resegmenting a market because when you're resegmenting a market, you're effectively taking an existing pie of dollars and moving it from one player to another. Whereas when you are investing into a new category or a new technology, you're really riding the growth of that market. And um, in many cases, you could become a platform and accrue a lot of the network value within that market. And so 
uh, it's critical to think about how technologies apply in certain stages of a market. Can I take one other tack at it, which is I've been thinking a lot recently because I, all the spaces we invest in seems to be like sort of these hip and hot spaces right now. Um, so I think a lot about the Gartner hype cycle. And what happens there is that you have, and I think this is, we are on that rise and rise in, the, in this VTOL and new aerospace and aviation space, we're in the rising trend of the hype, uh, Gartner hype cycle. But eventually it crashes on the other side and then slowly people build out their, their proper business. Um, in the early stages of such a rise, you see a lot of investments in core technologies, whether it's the aircraft or components that go into the aircraft and so on and so forth. Um, I think capital flows in because there's a lot of hype in the space. Uh, a lot of companies get funded that don't quite build a business, but they think the technology will actually take them all the way through. Uh, a lot of those businesses see a big trough on the other side. Um, especially pure technology businesses, and often you see those technology investors are pretty beat up by the end of it, so when the real trend of rising comes on the other side, they are actually not the ones participating, it's the other guys who step in. Um, so we've been focused quite a bit on figuring out that we totally believe that the technology is not quite there yet, and hence we need to invest in core technologies, but we're really trying to understand who's also building a business at the same time, versus riding the hype of, I have such amazing technology, that I should just keep raising more and more money come down on the other side. We've seen that story play out in the drones industry that all of us are familiar with. Um, and I think we're starting to see early signs of the same thing happening in the autonomous car space as well. Let, let's talk more about where you guys are investing because that's a great lead in it. In our kind of prep conversations, you know, each of you had a different approach. Many of you are focused on the ecosystem. I like Ethan, like full stack companies. And it goes back to Bilal's comment of, you have the, the, there's two different approaches here. You've got the, the aircraft manufacturers that are, aren't traditionally venture capital investments. They are very capital intensive. They take a lot more money, but you guys are better at the services, the technology around it, the supporting ecosystem, the components, you know, and that. Can you guys, each of you, give us a little bit of your, your take on where you're focused and how your approach differs? Well, I mean, per personally, I've invested in aircraft companies, yep. and mm -hmm. it's because professionally we invest in software companies. So I've invested in Boom and XTI on the hardware aircraft manufacturing side. Those are personal <laughs> ones. That's based on my own experience designing airplanes and evaluating aircraft designs and markets, and I, I like what those two are doing, and I like how they're going about it. Mm -hmm. uh, professionally at Storm Ventures, we're looking for software execution risk. I happen to not mind if the software is flying around while it's running. Uh, because I can get comfort around evaluating the flight part mm -hmm. and determining if there's risk there or not. I don't want risk on will it fly or not. I want risk on team execution. That's what I have experience evaluating. Mm -hmm. So that's from my end anyway. Um, you know, our view is that uh, the business models haven't really shaken out yet. We're investing both in incremental improvements and what I would call moonshots, which is a lot of what we talked about today and yesterday are moonshots, um, most of which are destined to not work out. Uh, the reason why we're doing it, however, uh, and to your point about you know, these not being tradi traditional VC investments, is that you know, we're not expecting to fund a huge proportion um, of, of the, the capital requirements of these companies. What we are expecting to do is to have a seat at the table, because you know, our concern is as you, you know, run out of pilots, uh, the rise of gridlock, uh, the fact that in the US you can really only drive or fly, there's no other alternative. Mm -hmm. So how do we solve those problems? And those go to the fundamentals of us as a business. So that's the reason why we're there, um, partly to learn, but partly also to be able to be helpful. So you know, we have people in the company who have been through FAA certification. So can I bring those people to help the startups that we invest in? Hmm. And Raj, I'm gonna take us a little and close back. You know, you almost should have been on the strategic panel, right? because you come to JetBlue, you've got a lot to add as an organization, these guys are VCs. Do you have different hurdle rates than they do? I mean, are the IRRs you're looking for, it's not outside capital, uh, you've got, you do have, to some extent, a different value proposition to bring. Nobody invited me to the other panel. <laughs> so this is why I'm here. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I'll, I'll pass on that one. We can have an argument later. Um, so, 
Yes, I mean, you know, our, our goal is about increasing JetBlue's bottom line. So my hurdle rate is about me adding 1% of profit mm -hmm. to the end of the, you know, at the end of the day by doing these things. So we have a different approach, absolutely. Um, and, you know, our goal is to be able to you know, provide some value because I don't have $99.7 billion to invest in anything. Mm -hmm. So the small money that I have, I'm investing where I can make a difference by being actively helpful because we're in the industry. I was just going to say, strategics, however, are investing earlier and earlier. So I'm not so sure what the hurdle rates are, if hurdle rates is really the only thing that drives it. Uh, but in all of these deep tech areas, these, these hard technology areas, you're seeing strategic step up earlier rather than what it used to be, that the company is already profitable or growing really rapidly, almost as an option for an M&A. Right. That has actually gone away. I think it's a lot more of realization that you know, nobody wants to be the next Nokia and the realization that this change is happening and I think you should, we should be participating in it early. One, one, one thing I'd say is, um, you know, we've had 25 years of this amazing run of uh, innovation and value creation in Silicon Valley, you know, namely due to internet. Um, that, that internet change has really, in a very large way, transformed two industries. Um, one of those is information flow, how we manage our information and communicate with each other. Uh, and then the second one is e-commerce, right? Or retail has been decimated by e-commerce. And that's been tremendous. We've created Apple, we've created obviously Amazon and, and, and Facebook and so on. Um, I think the, the component technologies are now getting to a point where people are realizing that all these other multi-trillion dollar sectors of our industry that basically haven't been touched by the internet are now ready for disruption. Um, you know, Ford cars are still made the same way, sold the same way, and used the same way. The internet hasn't really touched them. Um, even though they have a website, but I'm not sure how many of us ever went to Ford.com. Um, so I, I think that is a major driver of what you're seeing right now, that these problems have been identified many, many times over, but people, entrepreneurs especially, didn't feel they had the tools to really go disrupt they didn't have the market forces behind them to disrupt, and I think they're feeling that they can do that now. If each motor that Joby puts on their um, uh, on their craft would cost, you know, five hundred thousand dollars, I'm not sure they would be in this business. Uh, but I think they realize they can build that, they can do that. They have the computational capabilities available now. Software is becoming easier. Um, you know, Uber's of the world show that you can create actually link the entire world together and create a service on top of it. I think that is creating entrepreneurs to think about hard problems. And when we look at investments, it's not so much is there like one thing that has happened that you've invented some molecule that's a cure for cancer. I think it's a lot more of is this entrepreneur really understanding how to weave these sets of technologies together and, uh, and put a solution in, in, in place. Often you find missing links that something needs to be invented, which is where I think you see different firms take different risk profiles. So we tend to take a lot more of a technical risk, that's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a technical problem we can solve as long as the business makes sense. And there are other VCs in, the, in, in Silicon Valley who would say, we don't take that kind of technical risk, but we're more willing to take the business and business model risk and you know, just the expertise of the different firms. No, I was just going to say, you know, our thesis is really about uh, two pieces in the aviation business. So if you if you look at the aviation business since the late 1970s when deregulation happened, it's all about demand stimulation. And and to get demand stimulation, there's only two ways to do it. Number one, you either take the costs out, which is what's happened in the last 30 years in aviation and 121. They've taken the costs down enormously, and when you take the costs down. Uh, you get about a four for one stimulation factor, or maybe even five for one in routes that haven't been served by low cost carriers before. So if you, if you take that and then you look at the other factor, which is really quality of service index, how long does it take people to get where they're going, which has traditionally been the focus of business aviation. I think electric aviation has the potential to change both of those things. So if you, if you take a look at eVTOL, the biggest challenge with moving people around in eVTOL is it's just too expensive versus a car. If you look at eSTOL, it's a lot more interesting because you're, you'll be able to take short haul travel costs down tremendously and you'll be, able to take, um, you'll be able to take the time down. So if you look at those two things, that's the key to transforming the value chain. And then as the value chain transforms with the stimulation that these technologies are to create, 
you need to look through each piece of the value chain and see where the bottlenecks are. And, and our investment thesis is, first of all, you have to get the stimulation and then invest in enabling the different interdependent pieces of the value chain to be able to make that happen. So and you're kind of a, you've been investing in aerospace for a long time. So let me kind of put that in. You're Bain and, and you've been doing some invest and you've got Polaris. These guys are all kind of here on the technology side. I yep. think they think this is a transformational time, unlike any other scene kind of akin to, let's say, 10 or 20 years ago with the internet. So um, kind of bringing that full circle with the question we've got in front of us, you know, a lot of you have talked about the ecosystem and what you're investing in. And some of you have talked about full stack. Uh, can you give this group, who is really in the Silicon Valley world, a definition of what you mean by those things? Yeah. So. Um, if you think about a enabling technology, you can think about it as either a technology that fits into a supply chain or into a value chain. It's a widget that connects two pieces together. It's a piece of avionics. It's a piece of software that fits into an entire other stack or suite of technologies in order to enable a service. Um, and then there's full stack, where you're effectively the technology uh, enabler. You are the network, and you could also be the service provider. And so you're fully end to end. You're enabling te the technology, but you're also providing the service to the end user. So if you think help, about the help people visualize that, what's your example of a full stack in this space so they can all see it? Yeah, so you can imagine um, the analogy of what Waymo is attempting to do, what Uber is attempting to do by building the autonomous stack, by building and owning the network, and pro by providing the service itself to the consumer itself, versus just being. Uh, the autonomy provider, and then hoping that other providers will subsume your technology and then leverage it. The hardest part about being a technology is that uh, often technologies are mistimed to the market itself, and the market isn't ready to uh, consume or leverage the technology because the market probably doesn't exist yet. And so in many cases, these technology builders will actually go and build the service on top as an example of the, what their technology can do, almost dogfooding their technology, enabling the market, creating the market itself. And then when the market creates a little bit of maturity, then they could compel the rest of the market to adopt their technology. But without coming to the market first full stack, um, providing the end to end, uh, you often see a cold start problem and uh, you fall uh, uh, into the, the trough, as the law mentioned. I, I, I like full stack. I, I think full stack's more defensible, and, and I've been around it more. Um, my example I'll give is uh, an investment I did called Zipline. So it's a robot airplanes delivering blood and medicine in Rwanda right now. So full vertical stack. I wouldn't call them an airplane company. Did they design their airplanes? Yep. Did they build them? Did they write all the code that runs them? Uh, did they write all the autonomy into them? Yep. But at the end of the day, I would call them a logistics company. They move blood and medicine that's needed critically very quickly across Rwanda for the Ministry of Health, their customer. So that's that's a full stack to me. So when you say full stack, it's like it. I mean that is a, that's a definition of a service provider, bringing something end to end, kind of not doing the technology, but yeah. And I like software companies. So yeah. like to me, the, what the Ministry of Health is buying is the software that delivers that blood. Mm -hmm. Yes, it needs hardware to to ride in, but the hardware cost is not the major cost of developing that system. It's the software. Looks like a SaaS business to me. I, I was going to say, in, in early stages of any industry, you want to make sure you really understand your customer, who your customer is, what their problem is, and what are they going to pay for. So if you look at the industry we're talking about now, there's a lot of problems that need to get solved. And I'm not entirely sure why, for the longest time, the battery technology slide was showing, but, uh, but that's absolutely a problem. But it's only one of the problems. Um, you know, we, we have problems in avionics, we have problems in sense and avoid systems, we have problems in obviously networking and, and so on. Um, the question is, who is going to pay you? So if you solve the battery problem today, and this is why this is a big problem, who's going to pay you? Right? Like, are you going to stand in line before Boeing that, you know, give me orders? Are you going to stand before Joby and Lilium, give me orders? So let me give you and a if you don't have that, question. You have a that, problem. Because you bring a great point. So no one is going to get money or get paid until, well, except for the manufacturers who may be, but uh, until there's certification, because you've got no customers at the end paying. So we could have quite a long time, a long tail, development, a lot of investment, a lot of manufacturing done before we have any end customers paying. But are there incremental people who will get paid in the meantime? Yes, but you know, an example is always helpful because you can go into Perfect. a lot of different directions. Yep. Look at Tesla. 
they use 18650 cells assembled together, often by hand, to create a product that only the, the elite of the elite would pay to buy a Lotus car and essentially with an electric motor in it to give you slightly higher acceleration. But they were able to build a business that in less than 10 years later is now worth 50, 60 billion dollars. So the battery problem till today hasn't gone away. Right. Right, but they were able to build, going back to this full stack idea, that if they, were, if they had identified at that time, oh, electric cars are not happening because the batteries are a problem, so let me start a battery company, which a lot of people did and a lot of people funded, many of those went nowhere. They actually saw, said, what is the end problem that we're trying to solve? And the problem was mobility. So and they had to build a car, and it had to be at a small level, and it had to be something that a core customer audience would really like. So why aren't you investing more in experimental aircraft, like the, you know, the Kitty Hawk single, single plane or the, that an individual can fly around than the stuff that requires certification or, which goes into, and I encourage everyone to answer this after, or you b big believer that we're going to see FAA certification a lot earlier for these technologies, so you're going to see revenue in four years and not eight or ten. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that question. So. Um, if you look at when Tesla went public, it didn't go pu public on the merit of its revenues up until that date. It, it went public on the merit of the promised revenues, right? So if you're telling a big story um, and you have a sight line to a... But it had a, some revenues. It had some revenues, yeah, of course. But, but the point is that it was about the promise of the future. Mm -hmm. It was about changing the auto industry. Yeah. And so I think that regardless of what the exact revenues are at an exact time, you, there are plenty of examples in this industry and, and many other industries where companies are sold or they go public based on that you know, breakthrough potential in, into the future and those proof points along the way that's showing that potential. Yeah, I mean, particularly to Uber's plans, um, uh, I think they're batshit crazy. Uh, <laughs> I think whenever you come up with a timeline and the regulatory body has not been written yet, then uh, it's hard to really come up with a definitive time, timeline except for throwing a dart against the wall. Um, look how long it took part 23 to get rewritten. And uh, it probably gave us 70% of what we wanted, uh, though it was a very good first step. So where do eVTOLs fit in? Are they part 23 or are they part 27? Are they fixed wing or are they rotocraft? Uh, how are we going to approve electrification? How are we going to approve uh, to the 10 nines of safety? How are we going to verify uh, with a short range vehicle that has unproven aerodynamics um, and unproven composites that it could actually be safe uh, for uh, human uh, transport? I mean, I in the timelines that we're talking about, uh, Uber is taking a uh, uh, interesting approach where they're forward writing and forward promising revenues to eVTOL manufacturers to go and spend the hundreds of millions of dollars to actually build the vehicle and then say, hey, if you build it to our specs, uh, we'll let you into the network. And oh, by the way, we're not really going to take any of the burden of the, of the initial capex involved, and um, we'll just wait till it happens. So they're sitting in a really comfortable place, uh, and the burden is on the EV toll manufacturers. So uh, the bells of the world are spending all this money trying to reinvent themselves to become an EV toll company. And all while, I think the underlying assumptions and the requirements we're wrong. I mean, if you think about just the requirements itself, you might have a four-passenger vehicle. One of them is going to be a pilot. Uh, so that's a one-to-three ratio between the passenger and the pilot. If you look at the number of planes the FAA is overseeing at any given time, it's about 4,500 in the airspace today. We already have a pilot shortage. That pilot ratio is one to 200, one pilot to 200 passengers. So how are we going to go from one to 200 to one to four? Right? It would take all the pilots in the US just to service LA and San Francisco by itself. And so it just feels like a good end vision, but the, the, the plan um, to get there is, feels missing. By the way, it's it, just quickly, it, Uber is a private company, which is great, because if Uber was, was a public company, they wouldn't be talking like this, right? Totally. And I think part of what they're doing is, I mean, this is actually easy for them to do, right? What they're doing is they're telling all of you, get on the plan. <laughs> and start working at it. And if it doesn't work in 2023 or 2025, that's okay. Because at the end of the day, Uber is 
able to do this because everybody here is able to do that. And I think that's a very important thing that just needs to happen in society more and more. And frankly, because we've had a lot of this kind of innovation in automotive industry, in aviation industry, rather stuck inside public companies that are more conservative, that it won't, they don't get paid to do this kind of ballsy statements, um, we've seen innovation stuck, where the best thing we have in automotive companies now is like, you know, my, my drink can be cool. You know, it's, this, this is about a belief system, right? So Uber's trying to make everybody believe that this is gonna happen in the same way the X Prize was trying to make people, you know, uh, take, a, take off and land on a spaceship. So that's what's going on here is a huge amount of money is chasing a dream, a dream that requires a number of um, miracles to happen in parallel or at least in series, around batteries, around um, certification, um, and around uh, customer demand. Earlier we heard about how we don't have any customer demand right now. So um, you know, what's gonna happen here is a, a large amount of money is gonna get invested in these things because technologically speaking, we're close, right? Um, and then when that happens, somebody else is probably gonna figure out the use case. Most of these companies are not going to make it, and that's true in venture generally, but in this space in particular. And a lot of the companies that approach us um, where they want to sell a piece of software into aviation, the reality is the market isn't that big. So to Dean's point, you've got to increase the size of the market. You've got to get over the mobility challenge, and this is a potential way of doing it. But let's, let's be clear. Most of the companies we're talking about today will not be around. I'm, I'm going to say something unpopular, I think, on this panel. I'm going to defend Uber. Um, so what I'd say is that when they came out with this white paper, um, I think it had a big impact on the industry overall. Um, and I was just talking to a few folks uh, last night at dinner, and um, it, it, it kind of catalyzed like all this activity. Um, certainly, some act a lot of activity was happening before that, um, but they at least showed some of the world. They had they they have some uh, level of credibility, and they showed the world that with with you know, a lot of detail and a lot of research that this is possible. So give them credit for that. Give them credit for, for Uber Elevate, um, which is a great conference as well. Um, but that said, I think to, to kind of play the other side, I think there are companies that are going to partner with Uber and are more than willing to hand off the service aspect of it and the customer facing relationship. And I think there are a lot of companies that are saying, no, we think we could do that ourselves. And we think we could capture more value and do it that way. I think. Both approaches make sense, and uh, it, it just depends on what your strategy is. I, I, I think if you are, sorry, if you're yeah, an EV toll manufacturer and you hand off your vehicle to Uber, you've effectively uh, killed your business because you've turned your business into a high capex, low margin business, low multiple business, and whether you're being valued by the public market or the private market, you're gonna be a two or three X in revenue business at best. So just to clarify on this part, but I haven't heard Uber say they wanna operate the aircraft, and I've never heard, I haven't really heard any manufacturers say they wanna operate. So we've still got a multiple levels in there. I mean, what Uber is talking about is at least helping do some broad conversations about what the ecosystem has to look like, right? Is that, would you agree? I mean, they're not talking about operating the aircraft. I mean. Uh well, if, if, I guess it depends. Uh, in a network, it's very different than an airline, right? So in a network today, U Uber is the operator of the vehicles, and they're contracting out the actual driving to drivers. In an air, in an air network... But cars are different than airplanes, as we all know. And the FAA. Uh, absolutely. So someone has to be the actual operator of it. But in this case, in Uber Elevate and Uber Air, the accrual of value will actually go to the network. Because the network... Don't argue that point, right. but, yeah. Well, there, there's... Uh... There's also, in the, even in the autonomous car space, um, the idea that Uber starts to operate as an OTA, like an online travel agent, is becoming more and more real. Mm -hmm. So Uber's model is evolving itself, and I think one year ago, I would actually 100% agree with that, that if you hand over your vehicle to Uber, what are you doing? Um, you become basically a metal stamper in, you know, of, of some sort. Uh, but that may not be true in the future. So o Uber might, for those who may not know OTA, they may, may I just say, here's an origin destination pair. It needs, this person needs to go from this origin to this destination. In real time, all the, um, you know, the, the operators can bid into that system and win, just like, you know, when I go on kayak, I have Delta and American and everyone bids into that system and I buy maybe by 60 cents, but I buy the cheapest price, or if I'm 
you know, big fan of Alaska Airlines, I take Alaska even if it's more expensive. And I think the same thing might happen here. And if that happens, that's not so bad for the industry. Now, hopefully there'll be more network operators than Uber, but everybody doesn't need to become a network operator. You can actually distinguish yourself in your own different ways um, as long as you retain enough of the profit margin to yourself by providing services that people actually want. I, th I think what Uber's gonna find is there's gonna be a lot of resistance to having a, a sort of a system network kind of operator that runs everything. And, you know, if you look at the history of commercial aviation, um, the, the airlines unwound that system over the last 30 years and have fought very, very aggressively against that system because it's too expensive. And, and when you have one or two network operators that control distribution, what ends up happening is they take big fat margins on top of that. And, and then there's a huge incentive to collapse the price umbrella and go to direct distribution. And so what you've seen over the last 20 years in distribution is people have gotten absolutely ruthless about taking those costs out. And the GDSs, which were in a semi-Uber role, what's being proposed here, came back and got pushed really, really hard. And, and they got disintermediated, frankly, and now they're back begging the Part 121 carriers to, to put them on their, on their networks. And so I think this is, a, this is a great vision. If it works, they'll make a ton of money, but it's not gonna be without a massive, a massive battle. I think they're just too early. I, I really do. Like kudos to Uber for coming up with a strategy and a plan that costs them nothing, but gets a whole bunch of other people to do work to move them toward an end business goal, right? Like I don't fault them for that. I scratch my head a little bit and wonder if the talent in our industry isn't being wasted chasing this too soon. Batteries just aren't there. And I think a lot of people are investing in batteries as if they're on Moore's Law, and they're just not. They're, they don't double every two years. They take at least seven. My battery friends tell me I'm aggressive and I use seven. Right now, gasoline from an energy density by weight perspective is still somewhere in the ballpark of 50x better. So 15 years from now, it'll only be an order of magnitude better. You Paul, know? do you want to talk about the 500 uh, watt kind of number and why that is such a magic number in the industry? Kilowatt per kilogram. Well, uh, look, there are things that you can do with batteries. Right. Yep. Like, I, I, I would love to buy a four seat trainer that can get me to wine country in a half hour, you know? Um, but if you don't have autonomy, Pilots taking some space already. There's just a limit on range in terms of what you can do aerodynamically with a plane. There, there is a volume weight problem that's fundamental in the, in the design phase that is gonna make battery range and useful range difficult. And one thing you don't wanna be short on if you're up in the air having trouble is time in the air. Like, ideally, you'd like to be able to sit up there for as long as you need to, divert to other airports, just operationally, Planes are not cars. You can't just stop in the middle of the road. Or when the system to manage it. Quick question for all of you, and this is kind of, you know, I think this conversation, especially in the neophyte, gets confused between electrification, vertical takeoff and landing, and autonomy. And in fact, to go through, you have to go through a lot of the companies that are out there and say, okay, how, how autonomous are they? How assisted flying is it? Where is it hybrid? You know, are you, who's more excited about autonomy versus who's more excited about urban mobility and vertical takeoff and landing and electrification? I, I, I'll just start off by saying I'm in this broad space of this VTOL or aviation space, I'm probably getting, you know, one investment opportunity sent to me a day. And at this point, they all look the same to me. So my biggest problem is I, it's becoming, because they're all using the same buzzwords, they all have the same five-year plan, they all have the same slides from Uber, it's becoming really hard to tell where you're an avionics provider versus you know, I'm providing speech to text conversion for the standard planes, where you're you know, carrying cargo and what's different between a cargo and a pint of blood and what's the difference between that and one person. And, it's, I think that's a real problem for the industry from an investment point of view. Like if you cannot, if an investor who's looking for differentiation cannot tell the difference, it's gonna be a real problem outside for you to differentiate yourself and it becomes very quickly who can raise more money. So what you see now is people will be investing behind people that they think can raise a lot of money fast. Any final comments that will open up one or two questions? Yeah, I mean, we try to avoid uh, the uh, high capital intensive businesses, the ones that have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars before you can actually see any uh, shred of profit margin. And so we think about 
what are the core technologies that will be the market makers in the market and then enable that. So one of those are clearly going to be autonomy. Um, autonomy is going to be one of the key areas that actually open up urban air mobility because you can remove the pilot, add an additional pi passenger, um, automate the uh, network traffic, automate the uh, replace ADSB and be able to con uh, communicate to ATC in a more effective way. And so removing the human is a critical linchpin in being able to unlock a massive market. But in doing that, you also need the vehicles, right? So we can leverage existing vehicles that we have today, like helicopters. We can leverage uh, new technologies like hybrid that Rolls-Royce is developing. And then we could eventually possibly leverage elect elect electrification when it gets to at least um, the 500 watts per kilogram level um, at it with, with some stability. So it's really about timing and ensuring that you can put out the right technology and the market can actually accept it at the right time. So timing is everything. Focus on the things that are going to take out the most cost the soonest, and you'll, you'll have a good business model. I think what we know about um, aviation is that uh, you need all of the different parts to work, otherwise it doesn't work. So asking for forgiveness um, when flying is a different perspective from asking for forgiveness uh, as, a, as a taxi company. So um, you know, we're, what we're interested in seeing is a balanced evolution of these different things because uh, you can be right and too early, which means you're wrong. Paul, last comment? Sure. Um, just an answer to the, am I more excited about, yeah. I'm, I'm obviously a VTOL. I mean, I, I invested in XTI, not trying to go 100% electric, not trying to go autonomous, because they're both just too early, in my opinion. But we can do VTOL now. Electric motors gave us something magic, and, and XTI is putting them to use. Uh, I'm just going to add, uh, to answer the question, I'd say uh, equally excited about VTOL and electrification in the short term. VTOL, because it opens up new missions, it's a, it opens up a totally new transportation modality within cities um, and from city to city. And electrification, similarly, because um, of the ability to get rid of fossil fuel burning you know, machines in the sky and, uh, and emissions and pollution problems. In the longer term, I am also very excited about autonomy. Um, I just think it's, it's going to take a little bit longer. Does anyone... Uh Last uh, one final question. Uh, Uber's, Uber's a vision for the world. Does anyone here believe when it gets up and we have vertiports and we have point to point that it will be autonomous? Or will it be pilots flying you back and forth and you know, you'll have the, all the problems Ethan brought up, which I totally agree with? I, I think it has to be autonomous. And so if you compare autonomy in ground based transportation versus air, in ground, it's not a control problem because you have drive by wire systems, and so it's a perception problem. You're on a 45 mile per hour road, it becomes 25 miles per hour. There's a temporary stop sign, a kid crosses the street, there's human agent prediction. It's a hard problem that we haven't solved yet. In, the, in urban air mobility, it's the opposite. You don't have the perception problem because in most cases, there's nothing up there, and so you have wide open canvas. But in reality, it's a controls problem. Uh, balancing uh, a V12 vehicle um, with, with perfect uh, hover is like balancing a bowling ball on top of a bowling ball, right? It's an incredibly hard problem, and so it, it's a different dynamic in solving the atomic problem. But once you solve the control problem, then the atomic problem generally uh, can be solved with a lot of the existing technologies that we that we were able to nicely borrow from uh, autonomous vehicles. I believe that the first systems that we will see more people using will have somebody sitting inside who's either piloting or testing or providing data or whatever. It's, I mean, you know, the first Uber cars, I was a pretty early user, were black cars for business people. Business people are not always traveling with, you know, four kids and, and a donkey behind them, right? It's, uh, it's usually, I need to go from, you know, it took me, I just, for this conference, this 35 minute meeting, it took me an hour and 15 minutes in Palo Alto sitting in an Uber to come here. You know, you almost start to question, really, should I have done that? Um, and, and this is literally every day for people who live in places like this. And I think that problem will get solved, and I will pay for it. I paid 115 bucks to come here. I, I did not pay $35 with a guy making $6 an hour. So I think solving that problem, that's the equivalent, in my view, of Tesla's, you know, Roadster problem. Solve that problem before we worry about women and children wanting to get into a plane without a pilot in it. I think we've gone way over, sorry. Okay. Anyone have any last things otherwise? Anyone in the audience? Yes, uh, it's a question for Paul or actually anybody on the panel. Uh, I, I agree with you on battery technology and the limitations of battery technology. Why aren't, why isn't the industry exploring 
uh, hydrogen fuel cells? I've seen some um, hydrogen fuel cells projects actually, but I don't know that they're in a lot better place today either, uh, honestly. Um, and the thing, the controls problem, like it's, it's crazy severe with jet engines when you're piping thousands of degree air. Like the last VTOL plane I worked on when I was at Boeing melted pavement if you tried to land in a parking lot and broke the ribs of anybody foolish enough to walk near it without body armor on, right? I mean, and, and we didn't have that much control power. We didn't have great frequency response. And you start pumping cool air around with electric motors and fans, and you can get around all those problems. And, and so I think there's a big carrot there that we don't need to go to battery to get. And I, I guess I'm of the mindset, I want, I want the carrot. I want it sooner. Um, people are using hydrogen. So we're, you know, we've seen a number of startups. And actually, if you check out uh, in Europe, there's, um, uh, they're slightly more advanced in terms of where they're going with that. There's a couple of consortia that are out there as well, which I can, I can hook you up with if you're interested. Thank you very much, uh, Renata Johnson from Intradia. I'm actually quite fascinated to see what is happening in the aerospace industry as well as in Silicon Valley and technology, but I also see quite a lot of clashes between the two industries. So what do you think would be a good way to collaborate and have this open dialogue to really understand better each other for the well-being of really our industries? Can I just say one thing on that? I know I was at this conference, Transport Up, I think it was called, um, just a few weekends ago, and I realized, uh, again, how global this industry is. The entrepreneurs are not sitting in Silicon Valley. That is a fake news. Uh, they're everywhere. <laughs> and then the other thing is that a majority of investors actually investing in this stuff is actually not sitting in Silicon Valley either. They're actually everywhere else. So I think we just happen to be the aggregator and we just happen to have a very loud voice. We also like to think everything in the world will look like Facebook and Snapchat and will grow really fast, and the next thing you know, everybody will be on it. Um, the reality is that this is a global industry going through its own machinations, and, um, and, and I think they will find common grounds. We are finding common ground. If you think about the drone industry as an example, which is not that different from it, just bigger drones in some ways, carrying humans. I mean, of course, don't, not trivializing the difficulty here, but there was all this noise in Silicon Valley. You know, billions and billions of dollars were invested in it, but some of the most successful drone companies, not just DJI, but other ones, are actually outside of Silicon Valley. And majority of people who are gonna make money on it are also sitting outside Silicon Valley. I think, I think there's a great yin, yin and yang between the two places or, or industries. Um, I think Silicon Valley is prone to go faster and think bigger, and I think that's where we can add value. Um, and I think we can benefit from the aviation industry in terms of better understanding regulation and how aircrafts get certified and how to interact with some of these organizations. So I think, I think there's great complementary benefits to both sides.